Welcome to our video, Organizational Checklist. This video is part one, dealing with your ministry design. I'm Marshall Shannon with Ministry Design Concepts. Several housekeeping things as we begin this four-part series. One is that there is a PDF uh, that is available. If you want to pause the video and scroll down, you'll see uh, an outline that you can download. Let me encourage you to download it take notes because as I go through this list of, of items of which on the number of items on this checklist is over 25 around 27 so as we go down through them you can make your personal notes because every church is unique and all of your programs can be unique even though there may be similarities for instance you may have small groups or Sunday school or electives on a midweek service um, you may be ministering to different age groups that are part of your congregation or community, and it may all look different. And you'll see as we go through this. So download it, print it out, uh, take notes as we go so that you don't, don't lose the opportunity to capture a thought that the Lord gives you right as we go through this. Number two, there are four videos in this series. That means that I have divided the information on the checklist into four separate categories. Ministry design is the first one, manpower is the second one, management is the third one, and marketing is the fourth one. You're welcome to skip and watch them in whatever order you wish, but I had to put them in some kind of organized way to help you navigate your way through it. So all in all, there's uh, probably around 90 different uh, organizational checklist points uh, included in these. The third thing is you can pause your video at any time, scroll down, and there's an area, a section that is designed for questions or comments. But don't click submit your questions or comments until you've finished watching the video because the way the software is set up, it uh, will begin the video from the start from the beginning all over again. We don't want to exasperate you as you go through, but we do want you to ask your questions. And the reason why is that this is meant to be interactive. You submit your questions or comments. Those are shot to us, to myself and our staff, and we'll answer your questions. We'll uh, share your comments with others. Now, it's anonymous. People aren't going to know who made the comment. So you can freely say what you wish and ask what you wish because no one's going to, uh, to know that it was you. Now, I am assuming that in your setting this up that you've already done something. That is, in the process of creating or carrying out your ministry, that you're always in discovery mode. So I'm assuming that you've already done a lot of discovery before you started your ministries, that you were trying to get the important information and did your research before you designed it. You discovered key things that you need to know so you know how to design uh, your ministry. It's a logical thing to do. So let me just assure you that it really is powerful for you to prepare and plan well before you start your ministries, but it also is good for you to continue in discovery mode while you're doing your ministry because you should be monitoring and managing your ministries week, week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out, so that you can make adjustments uh, and, and, and adapt and adopt and amend so that you're your programming and your processes and your ministry design can adapt to a changing culture or changing needs. And so you don't just create it, plug it in, and run it and never look back at it. So here's the rule. Proper preparation, planning, and processes prevent poor performance. And so in this video, we are going to deal with the ministry design phase, and I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and give you different areas to consider. And so in the first thing on the checklist is to fully understand your philosophy. This is the why you do what you do. You need to have a 
clarity of thought about your philosophy of ministry and your philosophy of ministry design. If you don't, stop and go. You can buy it one-on-one, -on -one, just one product. Our uh, theology series, theology of ministry design series, you can go buy that one product, or I would encourage you to subscribe to our ministry design series, and you'll get that included along with all the other training that comes about so that you can carry out your own ministry master plan process to pull everything together for your church. But you've got to know why you are doing what you are doing. This includes your set of beliefs and the values that guide your actions. So know why you do what you do, but you better know what you believe and you better know what you value because those things are guiding your actions. The second thing on the list is you better have a clearly defined mission or purpose. What are you trying to accomplish? You want to be able to answer that because as you recruit and enlist and uh, educate and equip new people to serve in a particular ministry in your church, you've got to be able to clearly communicate a convincing argument or a propelling uh, argument, presentation, about what you're trying to accomplish. They ought to want to be a part of it. And so these are your stated goals, your objectives, your intentions, and your aims. You ought to be able to clearly uh, communicate that to yourself, to your leadership team, and to those that you would invite to be a part of a particular ministry in your church. Then every ministry has parameters. By parameters, I mean the boundaries or limitations you put on the program or event. For instance, if you're setting up a children's ministry, it's probably not going to include your middle school and high school. The boundaries or limits is age-related. The next item is your processes. Every ministry has processes. These are the systems you create to make everything in your, in your program or in your ministry run two ways, efficiently and effectively. Then every program, every ministry should have priorities. And you need to be able to answer what is most important to you. What is most important? Not the top 20 but the top three to seven things that are really driving. So this comes back to your core values, and they are applied to your ministry design so that you have to be able to tell people, here's what's most important. What are you trying to accomplish? What is most important? What are your priorities for that ministry? What comes first, second, and third? And if you have too many of these, you water it down and nothing takes on an impact or effectiveness in, in the way that you design a particular ministry in your church. Then your polity. By this, I simply mean what's your form of government? Every church has a polity. What is the polity for this ministry that you have? As you look at each ministry, what are the policies or the rules for governing? Everybody has rules and has a chain of command. And so you have positions or a chain of command. When you stop and look at every ministry in your church, does everyone clearly understand what form of government you're using, what are the rules for regulating and governing that ministry, and what is the chain of command? If someone at the bottom of a particular organization or ministry you've got has a difficulty, what's the chain of command? Who do they go talk to first? Their co-workers or the director that is directly over them? The leadership team at the very top of your church? Who do they go talk to? Who do they answer to? Who do they take uh, orders from? And so as you look at this, you ought to be able to answer and clearly help people see how are they going to function. What's the form, what's the rules, and what's the chain of command? As we move along with this, you ought to have an overall game plan. 
and you should be able to show them, maybe in a written document, and surely explain on a marker board or an overhead exactly what your overall game plan is. It's pulling together the master plan for a particular ministry and showing them everything. If you compare this to a football game, you've got offense, defense, and special teams. So as you go through that, you've got an overall game plan of how you're going to strategically approach the game and an opponent. So as you look at your ministry design, your ministry plan for one of your uh, programs or processes or events, whatever it is you're doing, it's, it, it varies uh, from church to church and different parts of your ministry, What's the overall game plan? Then you've got pathways, and by this I mean your routine practices. We're back to your processes, but this is what you're routinely going to practice. For instance, McDonald's for years was known for their processes, and their processes were clearly defined and practice so that a 16-year-old could do any number of jobs behind the counter and out in, in the uh, where the seating area is and out on the grounds. They had processes that they followed and set up, routine practices. Every ministry ought to have them. For instance, at the church plant I helped uh, found a number of years ago, and I'm seldom there because I'm out helping churches, but when I am, I know that we're going to have, before the first service, a list of things that we do to set up everything, and then to run them, then to take them all down. Those are routine practices for every ministry in our church plant to make it run efficiently and effectively, but also so that you can plug somebody into a routine uh practice or need or job or task and they can know what they are to do because it's routine. It happens every week or every time you do the ministry event or program. Many of our ministries or our programs have phases to them. It's a scheduling pattern. In college it's you know English 101, English 102. English 201, English 202, and then you may move up to something else. You know, American literature, English literature, 101, 102. It depends on how they broke it out. There's a scheduling pattern or routine, and many ministries have this so that people can see where they're going as they progress. Now, let's talk about the pace of your ministry, the speed of the programming. At what pace are you going to go? Let me use another example. If you've got a small group uh, ministry in your church, you may run that from uh, you know three, six, eight, ten weeks, and then you ch have people change groups, or you take a break for three weeks and start it again. You have a pace there. For instance, if you do a children's ministry, you may run a certain ministry during the school year and change it entirely for the summer. And it's not even the same program. So have you stopped and thought about the pace or the speed of the programming? When it picks up uh, speed and, and momentum and when you slow it down? How fast will things move along? The speed of it, how long do you give people to get oriented to something that you're doing where they're practicing the same things or repeating the same things over and over again for how long? And so when it comes to pace, what are you doing with each of one of your ministries, events, or programs? Then you've got projects. These are individual, short-term undertakings that accomplish your desired end. Along with that, you have programs. Programs are individual. They're longer-termed, usually, and they're organized game plans. So <clears throat> a project might be a short-term mission trip, where you're marching out into a foreign country or into our own, your own community or someone else, somewhere else in the U.S., and you are undertaking a particular task with a short-term desired result, hopefully an eternal result. A program might be week to week and month to month or quarterly or in a semester or, or annually, and it might run for three years and then you stop it. So as you look at this, this is one of the checklists. 
So it, programs are the vehicles that transport your ministry to your desired goals, and they're usually, usually longer terms. What potential does a particular ministry or event or program have? And you've got to look and say, well, what is possible? What is the bandwidth of that program, of that event, of that activity, of that ministry that you're doing in your church? By bandwidth, I mean the capacity of your church, your ministry, to carry out that particular event or program or activity and then the, the capacity and the capability. For instance, I have the capability of juggling tennis balls, but my capacity for juggling doesn't go past two. You throw a third one in there, and I am going to drop the tennis ball. So you, you need to be analyzing and determining the potential or the bandwidth and what's possible, what's feasible, and what the bandwidth is of your church as you carry out that program. If you run a food pantry, for instance, and you think, well, we can take care of 25 individuals or 25 families coming in to pick up food each week because our food pantry is only open three hours, our facilities is, on, is only this large, and we're only going to have this number of donations, and we're only going to have this number of well-equipped volunteers and paid staff to serve in each week in the food pantry. So we know that we can feed, we have the potential to handle this many people. This is what's possible. Along with that, you need to know what the payoff is. What are your desired results? What's going to be the payoff, the return on investment for your programs and events and activities? For your ministry, what is the desired result? What are you expecting to get from all the work that your people put in to it? I'll give you an example. If you go do a large uh, activity day where you invite people to your campus from your community, or perhaps you rent a, a ball field somewhere at a county or city park, and you set up all this uh, different things that they can do, and you have a carnival type atmosphere with food and big inflatables, and maybe you've got some things uh, doing that, and you, you look at that, and you say, well, the payoff we desire is to reach 10 families, to have 10 families visit our church the following Sunday. And you look at your what the potential is, what the payoff is that you want, and then you've got to look at what's probable. What is likely to be the results? Well, I would tell you from experience that if you have absolutely no connection to the people that you're desiring to get to your field day, that you're not likely to get the results, the payoff that you think, or reach the potential of what you think is possible. You've got to lay a lot of groundwork to connect with these people in order for that field day to have and reach its full potential. So every ministry, program, event, activity that you do, it has a set potential. You've got to determine what it is. You ought to know what you want for the payoff and what the probability is, what will likely be the results. So that you need to know how will you know if you've been prosperous. How will you measure success? Now, you stop and look at this as a checklist, and you build these things into your ministry design so that everyone knows what you're doing. You put it into writing. You teach it. You train. You discuss it. You hammer on it. You involve leaders. You involve the potential laborers and volunteers that are going to be a part of it. And you come to an agreement about these things. This is important. Now, every ministry has principles that guide it. Biblical principles, fundamental truths, things that are rule of thumb that you know is a part of it, and you need to decide which fundamentals, which fundamental truths or principles are going to guide that ministry, event, activity, or program. Then you've got prescriptions. Now, a prescription is something that is prescribed for you, for instance, by your doctor. He gives you a prescription. You take it, and it may be exercise, it may be uh, a 
medicine that you take, liquid or a pill or gel form, and you carry it out for so long. And then if it's not working, he may say, well, let's intensify the activity you're doing, and let me give you more of the same prescription, or you change the prescription or add one to it. And so as you look at the prescriptions, it's the directions that you're going to give that will provide guidance. That is prescription versus description, uh, describing what has been done by someone else. This is something that they're going to have to follow in order to carry out the purpose and to get the desired results. So every ministry has protocol. We may not think about this very often, but you know, you've got to decide what will be the expected behavior of your leadership team, of your volunteers, and of those that you're serving or trying to reach or that are taking part in a particular program, event, or activity. Then you've got to decide what is permissible. You've got protocol, what's expected of everyone, but what will be the allowable behavior by your leadership, by your volunteers, by those who come and attend or are part of your program, are you going to have an allowable behavior? For instance, you expect your children, your toddlers, to behave a certain way. But are you going to permit them to bite each other? And that happens in nurseries. It may have happened in your nursery last week or two weeks ago. And it may happen this coming weekend. And so you've got to determine what's, what's permissible and what's allowable and what, is, what do you expect. And what you do is you want to help cultivate people so they fall in line with the expected behavior in that ministry. So you're giving guidelines to them about how they're to do ministry and what's acceptable and what is unacceptable, what is allowable but what is preferable. So people know what's expected of them. Uh, I'll give you this uh, story. Years ago, and I don't know who did it, but they did research by taking a playground that was uh, surrounded by four streets. Let's just say it was four city streets. So you're in a downtown city setup. You put a playground in the middle with the jungle gym and all the regular nice playgrounds that you can have at a city park and put the kids on the field and then watched what they did. They huddled in the middle. It wasn't until they put fences up all the way around all four sides of the playground that the children played from one corner of the playground to the other and from one side to the other. They made full use of it. Why? They had boundaries. So give your volunteers and your leadership and your participants in your, um, in your ministry, give them the boundaries so that they can make full use of it, so they can lead and serve and, and take part in what you're doing. Next, let me encourage you, as a part of your ministry design, to set up a prospectus. A prospectus is what features will you emphasize. This is where you may talk about the ministry and you publish this to give it to a parent in your congregation or in your community who is not attending your ministry, unchurched, dechurched. They need to be rechurched and reached with the gospel. And so you're going to invite them to bring their children to your ministry. And you write up a prospectus that, that shows everything about the leadership team, the volunteers, the activities, the desired end, the benefits. And you, you be able, you're able to broadcast that and distribute it in all different forms. When was the last time you did a prospectus for any ministry in your church so they would know what the features and benefits that you were emphasizing in that program or event or activity? Then have you considered uh, requiring pledges? What commitment will you require from every person and every group that is involved in a program or a ministry or an activity or event? With your leadership, are you going to require a commitment from them, a covenant with them? What about your volunteers who are coming in? So you got your paid staff. You can fire them. You can fire a volunteer, too, but it can be much more difficult to do so. So up front, what are you going to What will you require of them? 
They need to know it. I'd have them sign it. I would review it. I would remind them. And what you're doing is people will live up to the standard that you require of them, and they need to know what happens if they don't. Do you have a three-strike rule or one-strike rule or no-tolerance rule? And who's going to carry that out? So for your leadership, your volunteers, and your participants, what is that going to look like? Now, I have a question for you. Is a ministry that you're doing, is it a prototype? In other words, can you borrow brains, or is this a first that no one has ever done it? Years ago, in a manual where I pastored for 18 years, we um, ended up starting t two things that were, we were really were prototypes in the way that we did them, um, for us anyway, around our church. I'm not saying no one in the world had ever done this before. Uh, because I had done it, but not in the way we did it. But we, we started a uh, men's round tripper. On Friday night through su Saturday night, we invited men to go down from Greenville, South Carolina, to Atlanta, Georgia, to a Braves ball game. We went down usually Friday mornings and spent the night Friday night in an embassy suite in Buckhead, a nice area in Atlanta. We went to see things like the Coke Museum, Underground Atlanta, um, you know, on and on. The aquarium, you got all these choices there in Atlanta. There's four million people there and lots of things to do. Saw a ball game Friday night, had great meals together, uh, set up and played board games and card games and fellowshiped uh, after the game to wee hours of the morning. Great disciple-making uh, feature. Had people come to Christ through this. It was wonderful. Now, uh, Saturday we, we had a great breakfast at the Embassy Suite, prepared individually for people if you wish, your omelet prepared like you want it. But we did this, but we didn't have any real prototype to follow from our ministry. So we went and borrowed brains. I had, while I was a youth pastor, taken up to 96 people to go to a Braves game, but we did, it was just a day activity, not a night activity. So you go borrow brains about how you would do that. If you would like to do something like that, then contact me and I'll help you look at the steps of how we did it because there were some very important things that we put into place that protected and cared for people while they went with us. And we did those uh, with Father Son and just with the men. It, it was a blessed time, but it was a prototype for our ministry. <clears throat> so we had to go borrow brains. The second thing we did was a couples retreat, which they're still doing to this day, that um, went to you know, four and five star resorts and were able to afford to do that. And so it was a prototype that was different than going to a Christian camp and having your couples retreat there. We went to somebody else's property and did our couples retreats. Then another question that comes to mind that needs to be a part of the checklist is proximity. Who else has a similar ministry near you? So if you are trying to offer something to a particular need, in your town, who else is already doing that ministry? Because in the design of your ministry, might you join them instead of having your own separate ministry? How are you going to interlock and, and weave together with them holistically? If you look at this from a kingdom standpoint, uh, they're trying to do a ministry, let's say, uh, to have a, a shelter home for um Unwed mothers are for, you know, the impoverished. Take your pick of who, homeless people finding shelter, and they're doing that, and you decide that you're going to build a place to do that or you're given facilities to do that. It just is good to know who is doing it. Back to the prototype, borrow brains. Borrow brains. Go find out their experience, their pains and their gains, the things that went well and the things that did not the horror stories they have to share, and the success stories that they have to share. Go borrow these their brains and find out. Well, how you're going to do that is find out who else in your area is doing a similar ministry to what you're planning to do or what you're currently doing. I'm Marshall Shannon with Ministry Design Training and Ministry Design Concepts. You can reach me at this email address or either one of these phone numbers. These items that we're covering, of which there were 27, is, is just the tip of the iceberg as we look at how you design your ministry. I've broken the other 
uh, items into three other categories. Let me encourage you to step from this one into the next one. Now remember, you can go back and fast forward through it. You can look at the PDF that hopefully you've downloaded and printed out and, and made uh, personal notations as we've gone through it, but you've got to design this in a way that will lead your pathway to be successful. And so the next item that we're going to look at will be manpower. So again, I'm Marshall Shannon, your ministry design coach, and I trust this has been a real help to you.